Uh, let's pray together, and then I'm going to try to lead us into the Word a little bit this morning. Lord, it is good to be here. I'm thankful. I'm very thankful that you've loved me, and uh, you've loved my family, and you've loved this church, and we want to be your people here, Lord, and uh, live by faith and not by sight. Grant me grace in your Word this day. Uh, help there to be something here for those who are our listeners this day. And Holy Spirit, you're the master teacher. Again, uh, we are asking for your presence here to show us Jesus. It's his name we pray it. Amen. I got a phone call on Friday from a, a friend um, in my last church, Central Baptist Church, George, Iowa. I, his name was Dale. I haven't talked to Dale probably in, I, I would imagine, four or five years. I still had him in my phone, so when, his, when he rang, it showed up um, his name and and we just chatted a little bit, and he just wanted to catch up, and he had sent me a package that he wanted me to be aware of. And anyway, we were just conversing how you do, catching up with people after a few years, and how's your family, how's the family, and all that kind of stuff. And then he said this. He says, Pastor, I found some uh, of your old messages. Do you want me to send them to you? And this was on cassette tapes. Um, and I said, Dale, thank you, but uh, no, it's not necessary. You don't need to send those to me. And then, you know, what pastors kind of talk like this, they go, and of course, you remember every message I ever preached, right, Dale? And uh, Dale didn't play along with me. He says, yes, I did, and yes, I do. And I, and I laughed. I go, come on, Dale. He says, yeah, Jesus. And I took that as a compliment uh, I remember messages that I wish I could just slink off the stage. There have been messages I've given here at this church where I've, I've immediately left the building because I'm like, that was not very good. Um, and those kinds of things. But my brother, who has wrestled with depression almost all of his life, I took that as a good thing. If I can get my messages down to one name, Jesus, I'm in a good place. Paul was like this. In Acts 25, 18, and 19, we read this. This comes at a place in the scriptures where Paul has been held in Caesarea for a number of years because he's appealed to Caesar, and, and yet the governor, Felix, didn't know what to send, say how to send him there, and so now a new governor comes on the, on the scene. His name is Festus, and Festus doesn't know quite what to write to Caesar. We're sending this guy to you, but we don't know the charges are against him. And so King Agrippa comes to Festus, and they... And, Festus says to King Agrippa and, and his wife, I'm, I, I've got this guy here, and I need to send him to Caesar because he's appealed to Caesar. He's a Roman citizen. I need to send him, but I don't know what to charge him with. So would you mind listening to what he has to say? Then Festus shares this thing with Agrippa before Paul even comes in, and it's this line. When the accusers, those Jews from Jerusalem who accused Paul of wrongdoing, stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not of such crimes as I was expecting. Now, remember, this is Festus. This is, this is, the, this is a, the governor saying these words. But they simply had some points, and this is important, of disagreement with him about their own religion, and get this, and about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted to be alive. Very important point. Is Jesus of Nazareth, is he dead or is he alive? Really important point. And so they, they, they grabbed, and Festus caught this, that the people that were accusing Paul said, Jesus is dead, done for. His influence is gone. It'll, it'll go away. And Paul stood before them and says, he is alive. And he has spoken to me. And so Paul has this hearing, and uh, he speaks in such a way, he's a persuasive speaker, and he speaks in such a way that he basically confronts King Agrippa and says, King Agrippa, you know these things, what I'm talking about, this, this man Jesus, whom I know to be alive, and who came and who was crucified. You know these things, and you know the Jewish laws, and you know the prophets, and you know the promises of the prophets. And Agrippa gets what Paul's doing right away. He says, do you think in a little bit of time you will persuade me to be a believer in this person, Jesus, who you say is alive? And then Paul says this in Acts 26, 29. I would wish to God that whether in short or long time, not only you, but also 
all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. He was literally in chains. They brought him in chains for this hearing. But he says, yes, King Agrippa, I would want you to become just like I am, except for these chains. These chains might keep me physically bound, but I am a free man. I am truly alive in Christ. All who hear, Paul had said in his defense in Acts 26, 18, in his presentation to these men and women, the words that are now on before you up here are the words of Jesus to Paul on the road to Damascus. So, Paul, you're to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. This is what Paul was to do. And this is why he is even in, in this courtroom at this time to testify to this man Jesus. All who hear that they should repent, he goes on later on in Acts 20, and he says earlier that they should repent to God, performing deeds appropriate with repentance. Now, not all of them liked what they heard when, when Paul said that, and that's why they were accusing him in the first place. They wanted him taken out, out, of, out of the scene. But that was what Paul did, and that's why he says, these Jews are trying to put me to death. Because I am proclaiming Jesus Christ as the answer to all the prophets and the promises of the Old Testament. And they hate me for it. But he didn't back away from the name of Jesus Christ. Paul knew him as alive. That's why they're trying to kill me, because I say he's alive and you say he's dead. James the Apostle writes this in James chapter 5, Therefore be patient. And in the context um, of what you're supposed to be patient about here, be patient in, in trials and testings of life, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too be patient. Strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. Do not complain, brethren, against one another, so that you yourselves may not be in judged. Behold, the judge is standing right at the door. I've been speaking about judgment over these last few weeks, about this is part of what we need to, we need to hold on to this, that there is an accounting for our lives. It is, it is the message of the Bible. There is an accounting for our lives. We must give account to God for them. We can't just skate on through, hoping it all works out in the end. There's an accounting that will be given. And so there's such things in the Bible that we see, and there's such things in, in life as we live it out here today. Um, there is a dispute still to this day about a dead man whom some know to be alive. Do you have faith in a dead Jesus, or do you have faith in a alive Jesus? That's still, these are, these are things that the scriptures speak of. Some just are like those who accuse Paul. This man is dead. Or like Festus, he says, I don't know. But he didn't really care about it. This, this guy's a problem. What am I going to do with him? But Paul said he's alive. These are such things that the scriptures bring out. There's life lived under domination of evil. Jesus used those words. Paul, I'm sending you to the Gentiles to deliver them from the dominion of Satan. There is such a thing that exists to this day. People under the domination of Satan. Who said this? Jesus did. There is a way out of the darkness. There is a way out of that dominion and, and force of labor or whatever you want to call it. And that is the forgiveness of sins. There are such things as sins for which we are going to be judged and answer for. And here's, and here's part of, these are such things that the scripture talk about. If you want to be a recipient of grace, if you want to know the wonders of God's love and his grace, then Jesus also sent Paul to say, repent. He told them, he sent a message of repentance. Repent from the life of darkness. 
Become like me, Paul would say, except for these chains, threatened with death and unafraid. That was Paul, because he was a free man. He was not under domination of darkness or sin anymore. Or like James, learning the patience of life. Learning to be patient and look at life as a way that, to honor and worship God no matter what comes. Like the farmer waiting for the, the, the fruits of his labor to come. Be patient because the coming of the Lord is near. It must always be in our disciples' minds that we are waiting for him, this man, Jesus, who is alive. So there are some things in life that just are. There's life and there's death. There are some things in life that just are. There's things you know in experience. You find out by experience. I have eaten liver. I do not like it. There are experiences you cannot comprehend. Some people have eaten liver and like it. That's incomprehensible to me. And I knew I would get the head shakes like this. I knew I would. But there's life experiences, we all have life experiences, but we don't all have the same life experiences. We all have different things that come to us. There are people who are powerful people in life. There are people who are helpless in life, weak in life. There are people who are free. I've met them. And I mean really free, like the Apostle Paul. I've, I've run into believers that have, I just, I come away from them and going, they are, they are free. And then there are people who are still captives, slaves in the darkness. And it's this last one that Paul, this idea of slavery to darkness under domination that he talks about, and I want to, I want to talk about a little bit today. He was before powerful men and women when he was in this, in this setting of, it, you would call it almost a, a, a deposition. It wasn't a trial, it was a deposition. They were trying to figure out what kind of charges to give him. So these powerful people listen to Paul, trying to figure out what to do. And Paul, all along, was not afraid of what they did, because he was free, but they were not. You could say in some ways that these men were the ones in chains, and Paul was the free man. So he's in physical chains, yet the people he faced were the ones who were still in darkness. Paul was free. And it's this kind of pressure of, of debt or bondage that I want to speak to a little bit this morning. We're a nation, the United States is a nation of 300, I've got the, I got the number here, 324,750,490. That's the latest as of October 8th, 2016. Given by the, there's a place on the UN where you can go and say, this is kind of what they estimate the population to be. 324, 324 million. Listen to this. That represents 4.3% of the world's population. We're the third largest country in the world, yet we only represent a little bit under, a little bit over 4% of the world's population. So what? It's this next thing. 43.3 million Americans have school loans that now add up to $1.26 trillion. The average school debt of people who are still, you know, there's people who in their 40s, 50s still paying off school loans. I think some in the 60s probably. The average school debt is $29,000 for all those 43 million people. The average school payment loan on their payment for in a month's time with interest is $351 out of their pocket to pay their debt for school. They have figured out that the class of 2016 that just graduated from universities and colleges this last May will have an average of $37,000 in school debt at this time. Proverbs 22, 7. The rich rules over the poor, and the borrow becomes the lender's slave. Remember? Now, I'm, I'm, you got to work with me here. I'm using this because I might really want to talk about money today. I mean, this, this weight of debt that people carry is a slavery. It's hard. It's oppressive. And so that's what the Proverbs says. But then we read in Proverbs 22 as well, we read these other words as well, that 
precede them a little bit. Oh, by the way, you know what the proverb is that precedes what we just saw up there? The one that precedes verse 7? I've heard this many times from many different people. So again, verse 7, the rich rules over the poor and the borrower becomes the lender's slave. The, the proverb just before this is, train up a child in the way he should go and even when he is old, he will not depart from it. It has a spiritual context, but it also has a financial context. And we are a nation swimming in debt. In fact, Americans are probably some of the best swimmers in the world. Swimmers in debt. Financial debt. But the Proverbs that precede this, that Joe has up there, I want you, I want you to see a little bit of how wisdom literature points out how to look at life. How to see it. Because he says this, a good name is more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold. The rich and the poor have a common bond, which also tells me this. Jesus also said this, there will always be rich and poor. There always will be. But they have this common bond. The Lord is the maker of them all. The prudent see the evil and hides himself. The naive go on and are punished for it. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. The Bible will always push us to look at the way it presents our lives and what's going on as opposed to messages that come from other places. But there is this massive amount of financial debt that we feel in our country. And many of people maybe even here feel a little bit of that, that pain, what it is to be enslaved to debt. Michael Snyder writes this. He asks this question. Could you live without debt? Most Americans say they cannot. Seven in ten say it is a necessity. Eight in ten actually have debt. Most of us like to think that someday we will get out of the hole and quit being debt slaves. But very few actually accomplish this. The system is designed to trap in debt even before we get out into the real world. Hence, $37,000 of school debt as a young person now leaves university in May of 2016. They're already what? They're already behind. And then they live with the idea that, or as Brendan likes to say, you'll always have a car payment. It just becomes part of the way of thinking. Do I want to talk about money? No. There's a different kind of debt. And just like Americans treat financial debt as kind of a normal way of life, there are a lot of people that treat this kind of debt the same way, just the way it is. The Bible talks about money debt. There's no way around it. In fact, it's, <laughs> this is a textbook on, on money, if you'll let it be a textbook on money for you. It will. It'll, it'll guide you. It'll help you. But it talks about another kind of debt. It talks about soul debt. It's a much weightier debt than financial debt. It's being in debt to God. Soul in debt to God. Many do not know the extent of such debt. They just know that something inside them and how life is working is just not right. And it's a weight inside them. But it's a debt. It's slavery. It's slavery to an unknown. It's slavery to I, what's wrong. Many try to pay the debt, but compounding interest of life presses them into slavery of unfulfilled desires. People pursue all kinds of ways of getting rid of that anxiety or whatever's inside. Many know or try to get out of this feeling of debt by, by inviting a lot of other current, using different currencies of life. And I know I'm using metaphor here. Many try to pay off the soul's debt, but use worthless currency that cannot be used for repayment. It's just like Amanda and Matt just went down for vacation. They went down in the southern part of our country just to go on a driving trip and just get away. 
and let's say they're out wandering around and they, they see this old oak tree and they see a little hole underneath this oak tree and they go over there and they see some wood and some metal underneath there and they dig out and they pull up this chest and it's full of confederate, confederate money. They open it up and there's literally hundreds of thousands of dollars in confederate currency. And so they go to their favorite 7-Eleven or their favorite hotel and they break out the money and they hand it to the people across the counter. What are the people across the counter going to do? This stuff is worthless. Yeah, collectors like it. But in some ways, soul debt, people try to pay off their soul debt with currency that can't pay it off with God. Trying to be good, trying to do enough this, trying to do this, trying to do that. Trying to be a good person, do the right things, all this kind of stuff. And they, they try to pay it off. But it won't meet their soul's debt. There's only one currency that God accepts for soul debt. Blood. And we still witness this in man's ways of dealing with each other to this day. Our brother Karim, those of you who don't know him, he's an Egyptian pastor who's basically in exile in the United States um, and knows that many of us in this church called me a couple weeks ago, and he asked me to pray for this man, a Syrian man who was in, in prison in Saudi Arabia and had become a believer and uh, was accused by the Saudi Arabian government of doing certain things and just pray for him that they would release him. They got a new trial set and all that kind of stuff, and they, uh, they wanted to have him released. And his sister, who lives in, is in Turkey right now, doesn't, didn't know what was going on. Long story short, Krim called me in, on uh, Wednesday of this last week and he says, uh, they executed him today. Now, I'm only trying to say that the Saudi Arabian government, which has killed more people than almost anybody else, as far as capital punishment goes, than any other country in the world last year, only Iran, I think, and China exceeded them. When somebody is executed, their blood is spilt. That's what they're saying. They're saying that this is payment for what you have done against us, the, uh, the Saudi Arabian government, Chinese government, United States government, it's payment. And in some ways, that's what we're seeing, what we, not in some ways, it is the currency that God requires for your sin against him. It is the only currency he will accept, the shedding of blood. Sounds gruesome. Acts 20, 28. Be on guard for yourself and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. This is Paul talking to the church at Ephesus. To shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For those of you who like these kind of connections in this, in this verse here too, his blood is Jesus' blood, yet he is referred to as who in this sentence? God. But that's the purchase price for us, the church. Blood. Jesus' blood. Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 and 5. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem, which is a buyback. It's a buyback. It's, it's a, it's a get-out-of-debt transaction. Those who were under the law, they were in debt to God's law, that they might receive adoptions as sons. Ephesians 1.7 In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of God's grace. Again, Jesus' command to Paul you go out and you take this message and so that the Gentiles will be delivered from the dominion of Satan and have the forgiveness of sins. We live, I won't tire of this, we live in a supernatural world. Physical sciences cannot explain everything. The Bible gives us the background of what's going on. And it says, your debt, that thing inside you that is anxious and not free, can only be freed through one currency, the blood of Christ. 
Colossians 1, 13 and 14. For he, this meaning God, rescued us from the dominion of darkness. This is Jesus' words to Paul. And transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son, in whom we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It is still and always will be a person's greatest need to know the forgiveness of sins, that their soul debt is paid with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'd like you to take your Bibles, and we're going to go to one last place in the Scriptures this morning. That's in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter writing in verse 17, at what we know is verse 17. If you address the Father, the one, as Father, the one, who impartially judges according to each work, conduct yourselves in fear during your time on this stay on earth. Um, now this is written, this is Paul, I mean Peter right now is addressing what I would call true believers. He's not, this is not an evangelistic section of scripture where he's trying to bring people from darkness into light. He's, he's speaking to people who know the light, they know Jesus Christ. But he's making a point here that as Christians, we also must conduct ourselves in fear upon this earth. We must not take lightly the gospel. We must not take lightly the things of Jesus Christ. They are not a hobby for us. They're not an addition. They're not, they're, they're not somewhere in our bucket list that, well, we're a believer in Jesus, but that's, that's also something else. I'm, I want to go do this and this and this. Jesus is Lord. And then he goes on, he says this, knowing that you were not redeemed, bought back, debt paid, with perishable things like silver or gold from your feudal life, your way of life, inherited from your forefathers. Yes, many times we've learned to blame our parents for our problems. The problem doesn't just lie with them. It lies with us. It lies within us. We have a soul debt. You are bought with a price, but with the precious blood of Precious blood, as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. For he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but has appeared in these last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and your hope are in God. And that's where we got to be. That's what we've got. Our faith and our hope are in God and our debt has been paid. Or has your debt been paid? Have you known that soul debt to be paid in your life? You've come out of death and into life. You've come out of a dominion of darkness into the light of his son. And I'll say this, my brother Dale that I started with, um, and I've, I've, wanted this, I've, I've wanted the gift of healing from God I've wanted a gift of healing from God many times in people's lives, not so much to heal their physical illnesses, but to, to speak over them and to, to pray for their depressions to leave, for the, the, the hard things to go away. And this brother calls me, and he, the depression hasn't left yet. But I didn't hear, I did not hear in his voice any defeat. Instead, I heard a man who says, I'm still pursuing a guy named Jesus, and I will trust him with my life. Will you trust Jesus that way? Is he an alive Jesus to you, or is he a dead Jesus to you? Father, help us to see our debt for those who believe in Jesus, who trust him, that the, soul, the, the very thing inside us that makes us ache, the sin, our debt to you, has been paid in full. That Jesus took upon himself our debt. And with his purchase price of his blood shed for us, individually, we can know the freedom of a man to stand in chains and say, become like me, except for these chains. I pray for this church, Lord that we would be Jesus followers, that he would be on our lips, that he would be in our conversation, that he would be our life, he'd be our all in all, and that you'd all the more focus us on the gospel. Lord, I pray for those who are here right now who 
who have that soul debt that's not paid yet. May they simply trust you, Jesus, that you took their place before a holy God, God the Father, holy, and you paid the price for them. May they know that freedom of being no longer debtors to God. Lord, we love you. We thank you that you've given us the message of hope because that's exactly what it is. For apart from you, there is no hope. All the other things are empty promises that do not meet our soul's need. But the gospel of Jesus does. Lord Jesus, we love you. And we ask for your presence always among us. Help us to take seriously these things and live them by your grace all the days of our life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.